relatively cheap education, which means I think in Canada, you only pay about 10% of the costs of your education. The rest of it is borne by me and by other people. Yeah. And so you need the certification because it's relatively cheap to get. You only have to give up time and opportunity costs and lost income, which most people don't really factor into it. Most most degrees cost north of a quarter million to three hundred thousand dollars when you put everything together. But most people don't really think of it that way. They just look at tuition. But Mm -hmm. because it's relatively easy to get, it then becomes a requirement. Right. So as you're aware, um, uh, degree inflation has been a huge problem in that a lot of jobs that you used to only need high school for you now need some college or some university or some SAGEP for, which is, it's because just so many people have it and so many people can get it because it's so subsidized. Now, if you don't have it, you're looked at as like, well, why didn't you go to college? Everybody goes to college, right? But that's because it's so relatively cheap, right? And so there's a huge amount of lost human capital because people get sucked into a college system which doesn't have a clear cost-benefit analysis, right? And so I... I don't think that it's necessarily the case to say, well, I I have to go. You have to pay for my education because you need this certification to to know you need the certification because education is so subsidized that everyone expects you're going to have it. Right. That's a course. And like it's circular. Right. Um, Sorry, I missed that last point. That was only one point. <laughs> I, I just got distracted at the last uh, 10 seconds there. It's, it's just circular, right? Because you're saying, you, Steph, you've got to fund my education because I need this accreditation. And I'm saying, no, you need this accreditation because people are subsidizing the education. It's so cheap. Like if it costs you yeah. $80,000 to get a journalism degree, would you get it? Um, that's a good question. I don't. I don't have that kind of money just lying around at all. But no, no, but you would borrow also, it and then you would pay it back from your uh, increased earnings, right? Like if, if it costs you $50,000 to get an MD license, then you'd probably do that if you wanted to be a doctor because you'd be able to pay it back relatively quickly, right? Yeah. So the question is, would it be worth spending $80,000 or whatever to get a journalism degree because it would make you so much more economically valuable that you'd be able to pay it off with your increased earnings. I mean, I, I have to say no. I, I actually wasn't very motivated for university uh, for a while. I took two years off school before I went back. Uh, and I made sure that I not only was going to be interested in my program, but just the, the cost is very affordable here. And that's a, that's a big contributor to me wanting to go to school. I thought I was getting ready to, to start doing other stuff and trying to pursue my goals and you know right. build a resume without so, school. So this is kind of an example. You got sucked into school because it's incredibly cheap, right? Yeah. Well, if, if no, it had that's not the expensive. only reason. I, I don't want to say yes to that. No, but this it it had a big factor, right? Yeah. Okay. So some jobs are clearly you know petroleum engineer or whatever. They're, they're gonna get jobs and they're going to do well and I think starting salaries there are like 80 to a hundred thousand dollars a year if you become a petroleum engineer or stuff like that right so there's stuff where there is a clear benefit to society but this is what i really want to get across to you julian if there's a clear benefit to society what that means is that it is cost effective for society to invest in higher education if it is cost effective for society to invest in higher education then the companies who benefit from those degrees or that education will pay for people to take those degrees. This is how my father got his uh, PhD in geology. He was uh, uh, an expert in finding gold in Africa. And so to get his PhD, his, the, the company he was involved with that he'd worked summers in, they said, go get your PhD, we'll pay for it. Everything. You just got to work for us for like two years after you graduate, right? And then, of course, they were hoping that he'd stay and and so on, right? So those companies that wanted my dad's expertise, and he was, you know, he lectured at universities around the world. I saw him lecture in, in Montreal, you know, very accomplished professional in the field. So the company that invested in his PhD more than reaped their rewards, 
for mm -hmm. that PhD. Now, that's how you know the education is worth something to society because people are willing to invest in it. Now, how many people are going to pay for, say, gender studies or art history or history, right? Not counting becoming a professor or working in the educational field because, again, that's circular. I mean, outside of that stuff. So how many do, do, do you think you could get a media outlet to pay for your education in return for a commitment for you to work for them afterwards? I think so, yeah. I think I, uh, I could. Great. Then you don't need to come to me with a fucking tank. You don't need to force me to do it. Because what would happen is if we had a system wherein it wasn't a push economy subsidized by people who want to get an education because that's kind of what's expected. We want a pull economy where people who need skills pay for people to acquire those skills in return for a work commitment. That way, you know for sure that what you're doing has value because people are willing to subsidize you for it at an individual level. There's no violence involved. And by the way, you don't graduate saying, oh, man. <laughs> I've got an undergraduate degree in history or something like that. What do I do, right? Well, you say, would you like double foam on that, I suppose, right? But you know you have a job in the field afterwards guaranteed, right? Now, that's how we need to fund higher education. But I'm always concerned when people say, hey, man, there are these intangible benefits. And then they give me scare scenarios like, well, we could dissolve into civil war unless people have lots of gender studies degrees. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. That's just that's I mean, that's just a uh, Pascal's wager. You know, basically, it's, you, you're basically doing a stick up, you know, give me my tuition or the future gets it. You know, that's not what you want to do. Right. If, if you say to me, listen, Steph, if I get my journalism degree. I'm going to produce. A hundred thousand dollars worth of value every year, right? And my living expenses are only going to be fifty thousand. Just take taxes out of it for the moment, right? So I'm going to, you know, if I don't get a journalism degree, I'm going to make thirty thousand dollars a year. If I have a journalism degree, I'm going to make a hundred thousand dollars a year, which means I contribute that much more value. Well, I'd say great. Then you don't need to come at me with a gun. Just come at me with a contract. I'll lend you the money. You can pay me back with some interest out of the money you make from your degree. Right. People who make a degree make a million, make like a million dollars more over the course of their lifetime. They don't need subsidies. <laughs> right. That's that, I don't know. That's like me saying, uh, you know, Brad Pitt would do a lot better with the ladies if only I could introduce them to him. <laughs> it's like I think Brad Pitt doesn't need any subsidies from me on how to meet women. So if you have student. something that is of real value, people will pay you for it. If they don't, then don't give me these scare stories of third world countries and civil wars and therefore this is a stick up. Give me your money, Whitey. I mean, that's just not what I want to hear. But isn't a student debt problem in the first world, uh, let's say comparing the U.S. to Quebec, isn't that a much bigger problem than, than having the population subsidize some of the education? I Sorry, I don't understand uh, what you're saying. Like we have very low student debt in comparison to anywhere in the United States. That's That's a direct result of the subsidization. Yes, but oh my God, you've been so well trained by the government. I'm so sorry to tell you this. I mean, my God, you're just like this, uh, this chattering 1984 output box. Dude, where do you think the money has come from? What is the provincial debt of Quebec? Um, I used to know this, actually, because I used to talk about separation. I'm not sure where it's done now. huge is the phrase you're looking for. Like, unbelievably ginormous. Like, it's, nowhere it's near pretty the subsidized here in Canada, too. That. It's pretty subsidized here in Canada, too. Per, in, sorry, in Ontario, too. Per capita, in Ontario, we have a provincial debt five times higher than California, which is known as the basket case outside of Michigan of America. So all that's happened is your student debt has been transferred from you to your children. You, there's, I, no, there's no free lunch. There's no such thing as a free lunch. I guess that makes sense. What's it? Put, uh, Mike's just looking it up. So t Quebec has an official debt of $270 billion. What is it per capita? Oh, God. It's the highest in Canada. At least it was the last time I checked. 
Well, and of course, most of that money goes directly to the mafia, right? You know what Quebec politics is like. That's something else I think we should protest. Yeah. Okay. Good luck with that. <laughs> I mean, it's the mafia. I mean, it's right. two mafias, but one has a flag. So um, anyway, look, I mean, it, it, you could get your, your subsidies, but the money still has to come from somewhere, right? Of course, when governments began subsidizing education, that's when the cost of education went through the roof. Because whenever you start subsidizing something, you start school spending huge amounts of money. And so then they end up in debt. The government ends up in debt. Students get a bit of a break, but so what? It just, like, so much money gets hoovered out of the economy that all that happens is your salary is simply far lower than it would have been if you hadn't got this, quote, free tuition. So, um, anyway, listen, I mean, I, I sort of don't want to keep hammering you on this uh, stuff, and I do apologize for being uh, <laughs> relentlessly abrasive. I, I'm sorry. I'm, no, uh, I mean, I, I enjoy the argument like this. It's to overcome that, but uh, there's not enough <laughs> quaaludes on the planet to put up my ass to have you stop doing that but um you keep uh, listening to to this stuff i mean look at the sort of you, you can find these um videos on youtube like the scams of higher uh, education here we go in latest research bulletin on government debt the fraser institute notes that quebec continues to have the highest debt per person of any canadian province twenty two thousand three hundred, not including our share of the federal debt which is another nineteen thousand. So let's just shave it off, right? $40,000 uh, in, in debt. Well, is that bad? Well, yeah, because see, <laughs> there's quite a lot of children in that number. This is per person, not per working person, right? So there's a lot of kids there, a lot of retired people. Also, a lot of government workers whose salary is paid out of that and cannot therefore logically be used to pay into it. And so if you look at private sector worker in terms of the debt that is owed by Quebec, it is going to be far more than their annual income. I would guess $120,000, $130,000, $140,000. Well, no, that wouldn't even count unemployed people or underemployed people or people who don't pay taxes because they're in school or people who don't pay taxes because they make too little. It's probably closer to the people who are actually paying taxes to about $200,000. And so either you're going to be broke or you're going to be making money and be on the hook for $200,000. So it's not free at all. And uh, to, to protest and say, I want free stuff is simply saying, I want the debt to be passed on to other people or myself in the future or for sure my children. And that's not really very fair, right? You know, the account, like the environment, I'm sure you accept that we don't want to completely screw up the environment and leave our kids standing in a satanic mill Dickensian ash heap of environmental degradation. We borrow the environment from our children, right? I mean, they deserve to have an environment delivered to them that is livable and, and, and safe and, and relatively clean and all that kind of stuff, Right. Well, the same is true of the economy. We borrow the economy from our children. And the amount of debt that we are piling on our children, the amount of inflation that we're piling on our children is absolutely staggering. I mean, we're clear-cutting the planet in the economy of the future. We are irradiating the fish. We are driving all the birds from the sky with fiat currency arrows of Feather piercing death. And it's absolutely horrendous. If we had any kind of sense of really what we're doing to the economy of the future, and I say this, you know, you're a young guy and uh, I'm a middle aged guy. And what my generation has done to the economic opportunities of your generation is damn close to fiscal genocide. It is damn close to fiscal genocide. We have bribed, we have bought, we have paid ourselves, we have uh, hoarded, uh, we have uh, inflated, we have kept. So many of the economic advantages we inherited from the previous generation, we have squandered and eaten. We have eaten the seed crop and now expect 
you to live through a starved spring. And I think it's brutal. And I think for you to protest and say, well, a little more free stuff will solve my problems only shows to me how effective government propaganda is. Because it's, it's the demand for free stuff that has gotten you in the situation. I mean, God, just think about this, Julian. Governments have had you for 12 years, night and day, right? You get up at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning, you go to school, you go to school all day, you come home, you got an hour or two of homework at night. And the homework is all bullshit. There's never been a study that shows any effective positive correlation between homework and any kind of academic efficacy, even in the realm of math, where it's supposed to be the most beneficial. Homework is just useless, busy work. Busy work. It's the moral equivalent of uh, having kids in the Stalinist Soviet Union study Marxism in their spare time. Uh, and so the government has had you for 12 years. For 12 years years. Now you have graduated from a government school after 12 years of eight or nine hours a day of education and homework. And what can you do that has economic value? That's a good point. Nothing, right? If you had to go and get a job with what governments had taught you in 12 years, 12 years, what would you do? I mean, it does make sense when you talk about it that way. I definitely think that the first few years, you do learn a lot, but then it all kind of does start to slow down. Well, and in fact, in most studies in the U.S., the longer a child is exposed to government education, the worse the child does intellectually. It is a brain virus. They might as well be releasing some brain-eating virus in the form of matronly, generally overweight public sector union bugs into your brain so they can eat stuff up and discard you and then have universities try to rescue you and generally fail. But at the beginning, you learn how to learn. In other words, you learn your letters, you learn some numbers, you learn to read and so on, right? Yeah. And that you can do at home. Done all that for my daughter. <laughs> don't need, don't need, you don't need a government professional educator to say c-a-t cat cat do you know one of the things that's not too hard to teach other people is what you already know how to do look i can walk i can teach my daughter how to walk look i can read i can teach my daughter how to read look i can do numbers i can teach my daughter how to do numbers i can teach her how to play tennis i can teach her how to fly fish i can teach her how to ski i can teach her how to do all the things i know how to do so you don't need government schools to teach children letters and numbers. I don't know what education looks like in a free society. I know it sure as hell isn't going to look like anything like this. And by the time you graduate, let's say that you are going to be 17 or 18 when you graduate. I think it's 17 now because they got rid of grade 13. Didn't give me a goddamn refund for another fucking year I spent in that shit pit. But let's say you graduate at 17. My God. I mean, I have been running my show a little longer than half the time most people spend in government schools. Every course you could imagine is available online from the very best teachers from the very Ivy League schools. There's that end of the spectrum, and then there's me in a car, <laughs> right? So there's everything out there for you to learn what, whatever you need, whatever you want. So the idea that we need all of this formal structure in order to learn, grades and tests are antithetical to learning. Homework is antithetical to learning. Summers off are antithetical to learning. Hey, you got a really big, important operation, doctor. Go on vacation for two months, then do it. <laughs> no, I think practice makes perfect. You don't take two months off from anything and expect to be as good at it when you come back. Putting children segregated by age is antithetical to learning and it's antithetical to the development of empathy. Really? I never thought about that. The, the development of empathy has a lot to do with children of different ages being together, which is the Waldorf school approach. Because if you get kids, kids of the same age, what are they? They're competitive. 
mm-hmm. right? Competition is a fine thing. Don't get me wrong. I want to be the best at what I do. But competition does not foster empathy. Competition can help foster excellence, and excellence is an important part of life, but it doesn't really foster empathy. What fosters empathy is, oh, here, I was helped with this by some older kid. Let me help you, younger kid. Let me be your mentor. Let me help you. Let me find out if I know this by trying to explain it to someone who's two years younger than me, right? If I think that I know long division, let me try explaining it to someone who's six. That's how I know if I really know it. So then don't you think we should be protesting for schools that are like that as opposed to what we have now? Or if not protesting, how could we achieve having a much better system like the one you're describing? Well, you have to get rid of the monopoly on violence. And I, I guess protesting is not your answer to that. Do you have any uh, no, proposition? Listen, first of all, government, educa- government teachers have absolutely no interest in furthering rational thought and ethics among the students. That's, that's a generalization. Sorry? That's a generalization, I think. I, I, I didn't say none sure. of them do it. I said they have no incentive. Okay, sorry. I didn't hear right? that. Most people have no incentive to jump off a bridge. That doesn't mean nobody jumps off a bridge, right? Right. And generally, the best students, sorry, generally the best teachers are the ones who get chased out by the unions. I don't know if you ever saw a film with James, James Earl Olmos or Edward Olmos or something like that, Mr. Battlestar Galactica, called Stand to Deliver about an outstanding teacher in America well, he quit in frustration. John Taylor Gatto voted the best teacher in New York State, quit in horrifying frustration. Uh, read um, The Bee Eater about Michelle Ree, who tried to take on an incredibly corrupt and vile teacher's union. And couldn't, like she had a proposal that said, listen, <laughs> If, you, if you're a good teacher, like currently you're making like 60, 70 K. If you're a good teacher, you'll make 125, 150. If you get like, if your students do well, if you get good uh, responses, if, you'll make a, a shit ton of money. But if, and, and all we want in return for that is that if you're shitty and your students hate you and they learn nothing, we'll fire you. Right? If you do really well, you'll make a fortune. And if the students hate you and they learn nothing, you'll be fired. That's not radical to me. That's basic market value. And that's how you get people in front of the kids who can motivate the kids and who the kids care about. She fought tooth and nail to get this, and the union wouldn't even bring it to a vote. It wasn't even rejected. It was not even allowed to come to a vote. As the past head of the American student, uh, the American Teachers Union said, I will start caring about the interests of children when children start paying union dues. The children are hostages because the parents are forced to pay. They are hostages to extract more money from desperate parents and terrified politicians whose economy that they rely on for taxes will grind to a halt when students do, or when, when schools do. It's all, it's all a shakedown with children as hostages. Now, does that mean that some people aren't nice to the hostages? Sure, they some, some, some of them are nice to the hostages. I had one or two teachers who, a few times in my life, showed me some little bits of kindness in my 22-year career in education or 22-year uh, exposure to education in a variety of countries, in a variety of public and private and, and, and three different universities uh, from undergraduate to a master's level. A few teachers on occasion, maybe it happened five or ten times over the course of my entire time there were vaguely nice about something. And that's not proof of anything. I'm just telling you my my experience. Let's say I wanted to start a school then. Oh, thanks. Uh, Let's say I wanted to start a school that that preaches those values or those those ways of teaching you talk about. Mm -hmm. I imagine you, the state, wouldn't really want that if it if it sees it as being much better than uh, what they're offering. Yeah, well, of course, um, whatever you try to do 
with uh, a school, you, you, you're basically asking people to double pay because they pay through their property taxes and then they, you ask them to pay again, whatever it's going to be. I think, it, what is it, 45% of public school teachers in Detroit send their kids to private schools? <laughs> no, that's, that's very important. Yeah. And they're, they're the ones who can afford it, who have enough security. I mean, I bet you they all would if they could. Yeah, the people um, my age I met in the States all went to private school to get sure. the better education. Sure. The real education. Well, I don't know how much better it really is, but I know that the public lots, ones there are terrible. There's lots of studies that say that the, the, quote, quality of your education doesn't have anything to do with how you turn out. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but there's no data that people can find. Uh, and you can look at Charles Murray uh, on this uh, M-U-R-R-A-Y. There's no data that can conclusively show that if you send your kids to this school or that school, that end up better educated. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the complexity and challenges of education is, uh, is, is very de deep and very great. Philosophers for 2,500 years have been saying, how the fuck do we get people interested in philosophy, right? <laughs> and this has been my, you know, big, big challenge. Hey, why did you come on board this little education express, which will set you at odds with your society and cause lots of problems in your personal relationships and make you really unhappy for no particular clear benefit you can find in the short run and no possibility of social change in any fundamental way during the course of your entire lifetime? Come on board. We're going over the cliff, baby. But slow enough that you'll feel it hurt. So it's a huge challenge. Uh, I don't know the answer as to how you get people... Uh, educated, a lot of it seems to have to do with innate intelligence. Uh, a lot of it, uh, uh, now, I, I think that children who go to private school have a happier time. I think that they have a nicer time, but it doesn't seem to affect, in the long run, how they end up doing in life. What that tells me is that putting kids in a classroom, in general, I just don't even know if it's that good an idea. You know, there's, there's homeschooling, there's unschooling, there's lots of different ways of, of getting it done. I don't know what the answer is, but I know that we're, prevent, we're prevented from exploring any kind of real answer about education because of this monopoly of violence that prevents all forms of progress. But that seems very counterproductive to all mankind, whether it, I don't know, I don't think it serves the government to to prevent people from getting the best or from at least working on the education system to make it the best we can have it. I think it's why, very Why doesn't it serve the government? I don't think it serves... I mean, I don't think it hurts them if they just have a smarter population. I feel like some countries, <laughs> let's say Finland, Switzerland, they seem to have a, a, a higher concentration of, of very intelligent people that are furthering things more than uh, Canada or the States. Well, okay, that's, I mean, that's a big topic, but it's a, it's a balance. So for the, the government wants people smart enough to pay lots of taxes, right? To make lots of money and pay lots of taxes. So they want people who have lots of technical skills, right? Yeah. They don't want people, they don't want people who are critical thinkers. They don't want people that they actually have to make rational arguments with empirical evidence when they give a speech. Yeah. I mean, you, you see Obama speaking. He's not, he's not speaking. He's like a swaying hypnotic cobra with those pauses and that certainty and that body language that just bespeaks a kind of certainty that goes right down to the roots of the planet. And this is the way that it is. And he rarely Force. raises his voice. So many pauses. Such humor at the uh, silliness of his enemies and... Uh, such uh, eye contact and so many pauses, such a good-natured certainty about everything that needs to be done. No doubt, no differences, no complicated information, no uh, emotion other than uh, ridicule and the occasional bit of passion for rhetoric that leads nowhere other than to people's little joy, joy, juice, endorphin, push button of happy futureness. I mean, this all, if you had any kind of intelligence, you'd stop him the whole time and say, what? How do you know? And what do you know? Are you saying there's no ambiguity? Are you saying there are no opposing opinions? How the fuck do you know with such certainty how 300 million people ought to live? How is that even remotely possible? Certainty in complexity is the mark of immense idiocy. And anybody who's in charge of a complicated post-information technology comprised of three 
hundred people, it seems, sometimes speaking 400 million languages. Well, anybody who's certain in that situation is a demagogic fool. So does the government want people to know the root of political power is violence? Does the government want to know that everything they want for free has to be paid for at gunpoint by someone else? Does the government want people to know the actual complexity of the law? Does the government want people to know how ridiculously hyper-complex the tax code system is to the point where people are doing something illegal just about every day and there's no single person alive who knows what is legal and what is illegal, but ignorance of the law is no excuse. Do they want people to become entrepreneurs? Shit, no. They don't want people to become entrepreneurs because they get a huge amount of money from big corporations, not from little entrepreneurs living in their car and struggling to to grow. They want people to go and work for a big, giant corporation so that corporation can give lots of money to the politicians. Also, it's a hell of a lot easier to tax people when they're in a corporation than when they're being entrepreneurs with all these write-offs. That makes sense. So, I mean, do they want you to know about the economy? Do they want you to know that, that, that currency used to be based on gold? Do they want you to know that they can print money at will? Do they want you to know that in Canada, when you go to a bank to borrow money from a house, the bank just creates that money and gives it to you like they've earned it and given it to you? They just make that shit up. The money is all imaginary type, whatever you want into your own bank account. You try doing that, you go to jail for counterfeiting. It's how the entire fucking financial system of the Western world works. I feel like that's why... We talk a lot about economics and politics, yet we seem to have no understanding of it. Is because we have no idea how much money is really being created. And for those who don't know, there's a good internet movie about this called um, Oh Canada, Our Bought and Sold Out Land. And um, yeah, I mean, if, if people had like 5% knowledge of how the economic system works, there probably would be rioting in the streets, which is why it's studiously kept away from the general population. And anybody who talks about it is considered to be a freak. All... all <laughs> All the governments have to do is keep the truth away from you long enough so that when it finally shows up, it freaks you out and you recoil. It's like the Matrix, right? All they have to do is keep the reality that you are a battery. Oh, spoiler. All they have to do is keep the reality from the battery away from you long enough and you fall out of that battery vat. You're like, this is freaking me out. right? So they just have to keep you in that amniotic sack of propaganda long enough that any kind of truth comes across like a javelin through the eyeball. So the government has an incentive to make you economically productive and easy to tax and dependent on authority and afraid of people in authority, which government schools do to a T, but they don't want to teach you how to think. They don't want to teach you to be independent. They don't want to teach you what ethics is. They don't want you to absorb the lesson of kindergarten, which is don't push, don't steal, because that's what they do all the time, right? They pay your taxes or go to fucking jail. That's all they got. Pay your taxes or we'll shoot your ass up. It's just a big giant gun wrapped in a flag aimed at your kids. That's all it is. All it is. And when people hear that, it has to feel alien and bizarre enough that they can reject it emotionally without ever evaluating it intellectually right it has to be like (laughs) it's a strange analogy but it has to be like racism like it just has to be oh my god that person said huh that's so appalling i could just reject it emotionally i don't even have to say anything right and this basic rules for radicals it's the basic left wing what they do is they just keep hurling shit at you and hurling shit at you and hurling shit at you and people people say like oh that guy He's got shit on him, <laughs> so I don't have to think about anything he does, right? I mean, and so uh, this is what, he likes Ayn Rand. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I can reject everything now because Ayn Rand was an idiot, right? And so all that they have to do is keep the truth at bay at you long enough that when the truth shows up, it, it, it just feels preposterous. The truth shows up for most people in the world after years and years of government education, like the rights 
of Aztec warriors from the 8th century. Like, whoa, that's some freaky shit they're doing. I can't believe anybody ever believed that. So, no, the idea that the governments are very, have a very strong incentive to well-educate in the trivium sense, in even the Khan Academy sense, in the free domain radio sense, to truly educate people on how to think. And when you, you know, you keep, keep listening to the show, and I invite you six months, man, I'm telling you, Julian, six months, come back and listen to the beginning of this show. And you will understand what I mean when I say you as yet, and I mean this with all sympathy and affection, you as yet have no idea how to process a rational argument and rebut it. And again, I'm not saying this in any hostile way. I'm incredibly thrilled that you're learning it. I didn't know it either until I got into philosophy because it's all kept at bay from you. How to think, how to rebut. You've been trained to listen to political speeches and try and get involved in the political process. I mean, voting like protests, if they actually achieved any real change, they'd be made illegal, too. That's just a way for people to blow off steam and pretend like they're doing something and keep them away from dangerous thoughts like thinking. But that aggravates me a lot. I'm very aware of that. It's I didn't vote last time because the writing where I'm registered, where I grew up, was uh, it votes something like 78 percent liberal every every single time. So. Right. And you want, look, you want 50, last thing I'll say before we move on, but you want 51% of people to come out and protest something. The only protests that really matter are those that reduce government power. Everything else is just bullshit. It's just uh, who gets to mug who. That's all it is. Who holds who down while who goes through their wallet and pulls out the remaining gold tooth they have in the back, right? That's, that's all voting is. The only thing that substantially matters is that which reduces the amount of violence in society, reduces the laws, the taxes, the regulations, and so on. Well, you just have to look at public choice theory. You can read Brian Kaplan's The Myth of the Rational Voter. You can – never happens. Because let's say I want to – let's say I want to – oh, I'm going to get a protest, man. I'm going to cut taxes by 20 percent. 20 percent, man. 20 percent. In other words, we're going to take Canadian taxes to about 1996. Remember, it was a huge homicidal wasteland in 1996 because taxes were 20 percent low. Oh, my God, it was horrendous. They let Mel Gibson out of rehab unattended. It was that kind of insane a place. Sugar tits. But um, let's say I wanted to do that. Well, who am I going to get to come out and protest? Right. Vast majority of taxes are paid by a minority of people. Because it's progressive income true? tax. Is that really true? Yeah, Mike, you can look, I think it's in the States. It's, it's, I mean, the States is not too dissimilar from Canada, but like give me the, the top 1% of people pay like 20% of the taxes or something. I mean, because it's progressive income tax because Karl Marx right. thought it was a great idea. So we as anti-communists said, great job, Karl. But Let's then what percentage the of the wealth? Tax in, bang or made and toss around on the street with our children. Um, we'll get the numbers in just a sec, but... But don't you think it should be equal to the amount of wealth, not equal, but proportionate to the amount of wealth they get, uh, comparing it to how proportionate it is for middle class people? But no, the whole point of progressive income tax is the more you make, the more you pay, right? That's what I mean. So shouldn't it be more directly related than it is right now? Oh, man, Julian, you are so deep in the matrix, I didn't even know what to say. I've been telling you the whole time that, that the government is violence. And you're saying, but shouldn't the violence be more distributed? No, it's like no, saying, well, shouldn't we find a way to distribute no, 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 rape no. more equally that's, among the female that's, population? That's not what I said. What I'm saying is that if the top 1% pay 20% of the taxes but earn 80% of the wealth, whereas uh, the middle class pay half their money in taxes, which contributes to the rest, then no, shouldn't no, no, the look, rich be paying half? Like, I'm not going to argue whether it should or shouldn't be that way. But what I'm saying is that a huge amount of taxes are paid by a pretty tiny minority of people. Because you're talking about let's get the percentage of people to 51% of protests.